morning, everybody. I'm Madeline McIntosh from Penguin, and I have the great honor of introducing you to Amor Tolls, the um, brilliant author of A Gentleman in Moscow. Um, and Viking will publish it this September, and the Viking editor for this book, Paul Slovak, um, occasionally describes it as a novel of captivity. And while that, that is true in a narrow sense, um, I realize that there's a risk in talking about captivity to a group of people who are now heading into their second day captive in this convention center. <laughs> so I'm really here to reassure you that the world that Amor has created for us uh, in early 20th century Moscow in the very glamorous, fascinating Hotel Metropole bears no resemblance to what you will experience in the food court today. <laughs> No danger of jalapeno chips there. Um, as, a, as a reader of Rules of Civility, um, Amor's first novel, published five years ago, I, I came to that as a reader. It was before I worked at Penguin, and so I bought it like a regular civilian in a bookstore, and I was absolutely captivated and blown away, as so many people were, by this, this fabulous story of New York in the 20s. And as much as I loved that novel, nothing in it prepared me for what, has, what Amor has created now in A Gentleman in Moscow. Um, imagine it's 1922, and our, our hero, the very glamorous, refined aristocrat, Count Alexander Rostov, has been condemned by a Bolshevik court to, um, to house arrest for the rest of his life. But where he will be under arrest, where the building that he may not ever leave again, is the Hotel Metropole. And it is one of the, the great glamorous um, grand hotels. And the, as a reader, you are there with him over the course of the next decades. And you see through the, the prism of this, this hotel, the world outside, of course, changes but you can't actually go outside. So it's the people who come in and engage with the count, um, the, the way that the count goes from being a fairly, um, not lazy, but an aristocrat, to actually somebody who is um, deeply engaged with the world around him on a, on a daily basis. I wanna leave it at that um, and allow um, Amor to come up and tell you more about this world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and th thank you for having me this morning and the, the panel. I want to apologize to the panel, first of all, for not being a redhead. I don't know how, <laughs> obviously, I'm at the wrong panel or something. Um, now, I, w uh, with this brief description of, of my, my new book, uh, I think I can imagine what you're thinking is, you know, <laughs> oh, goody, a, a, a novel set in Russia uh, during a time of hardship and austerity where the main character goes into a building and doesn't come out for 460 pages. You know, just what I always wanted. <laughs> you know, but um, the good news, the good news is that, let's say it would take you about, uh, you know, a couple of weeks to read my book. It took me three years to write it. And three years is a long time to be trapped in a, in a work of art, uh, even if it's your own. Um, so, uh, while I might have really set out to stare into the depths of, in the existential depths of the Russian soul, um, here's what happened. Um, as the book sort of got underway, uh, the Count is, uh, who's described, who's under house arrest in the hotel, is standing in the lobby, and the door to the hotel opens, and in walks a willowy actress. And uh, as it turns out, uh, within a matter of hours, the Count is standing in her suite, and uh, her dress is falling to the floor with a whoosh. Um, later, uh, it turns out that there is a uh, deep in the basement, uh, beyond the furnace room, behind a, a uh, there's a bright blue door, which is locked. Um, but as it turns out, there's a nine-year-old girl who lives on the second floor who has a pass key to the hotel, which she wears on a chain around her neck. There is uh, a small fortune of gold hidden in the legs of the desk. There are uh, antique dueling pistols hidden behind a panel in the wall in the manager's office. 
And in the kitchen, there is a sort of a, a group of collaborators uh, who are conniving and conspiring and um, uh, cooking. Knives are juggled, uh, passports are stolen, disguises are donned, um, and much to the consternation of the guests, to the joy of the denizens of the bar off the lobby, and, and to uh, the consternation of the staff, uh, one June 21st at midnight, every hotel in, uh, sorry, every telephone in the hotel begins to ring. Now, this is, in essence, a sort of list of sort of things that sort of unfold in the hotel. This is how, uh, as an artist, one breaks out of the prison cell of, of your own invention. Is whatever your intentions were in terms of creating this claustrophobic environment, just to survive the process of writing the book, uh, life starts to flood in through the doors. Um, and that becomes, that's the fun part for me as the author, and ultimately I hope it becomes the fun part for the reader as well. Now, needless to say, in the midst of all this excitement, there are uh, sentences that are so poetic, uh, so timeless, so insightful, that, w that within a matter of years, they will be on coffee mugs. <laughs> and, and in addition, each one of those sentences was written in less than 140 characters so that you can tweet them. And in fact, that joke was less than 140 characters, so you can tweet that too. Now, those of you who are uh, familiar with rules of civility will you know, be saying, well, you know, here he is, he's going back to the first half of the 20th century again, and it's true. Um, I, I'm not obsessed with the era. I, I don't have an overwhelming sense of nostalgia for it, um, the, the, nor do I do any research on it. Um, so, but the, the reason that I, I keep returning to that period is that uh, it, it provides me a certain amount of liberty. Uh, and this is because most of you in this room are reasonably familiar with the first half of the 20th century, but virtually nobody in this room has any first-hand experience with the first hand, half of the 20th century. Um, and that brings me to one of the great uh, sort of closely guarded secrets of fiction writing, which is that for me to create a persuasive landscape, what matters less is what I know than what you don't know. Uh, I can take advantage of your, uh, I, I, ignorance is too tough a word, but your lack of experience in the area to try to build something which is persuasive to you. Um, so, in crafting a novel, uh, my goal is really to gain your confidence early with a couple of landmarks, you know, like the Kremlin and some borscht, maybe Lenin's pointy little beard. And having done so, I want to then lure you to the frontier of your knowledge, and then I want to get you to take one more step. Because one step beyond the frontier of your, land, of your knowledge is where this sort of great vista opens up and, and where the, you know, the sunlight comes down through the, crowd, through the clouds and suddenly the, the unbelievable becomes believable and the uh, incredible can become credible and, and the fantastic can, can become tastic. <laughs> it doesn't quite work with that third one. Now, none of the central characters in this book are from history uh, or from, from my life, but, but I do try to pickpocket you know, my own life for loose change, which sort of populates the book. And so I want to kind of give you uh, two quick examples of that. Um, at the heart of this book is, a, uh, or at one sort of one aspect of the book, in, in the, near the heart, is a battle of wills between a, six, a sophisticated 50-year-old waiter and a five-year-old girl. Now, in, in retrospect, uh, the interaction between these two central characters springs uh, from an event in my own life from just a few years ago. At the time, uh, my, my children's favorite place to dine out was the local Italian right down the street called Paul and Jimmy's. And uh, you know, we would go there and the uh, Italian staff uh, would be, you know, introduce, uh, sorry, would greet my son as you know, uh, Mr. Tolls, and they'd greet my five-year-old daughter as, ah, la principessa, you know, come on in, come in, they'd see us, and they, the kids loved it. So on my son's birthday that year, um, I, we said, you know, we, we can go to any restaurant you, you want for your birthday, 
And we, we thought he'd say Paul and Jimmy's. And he says, you know, I, I want to go to Smith and Woodlensky's, you know, this venerable old steakhouse in New York. And, and we, you know, we were like, well, you know, how, how did you even know that, that word? And it turned out, you know, of course, we hadn't even noticed. It's, it's in, it was in, the, in the, ta uh, the advertisement in the back of taxi cabs. And so he had been like, you know, this had been his big dream. So, <laughs> so on the night in question, we all dress up. You know, we head uptown, and we, we arrive at Smith & Walensky's, and we get settled in our booth. And uh, for those of you who've been there, you know, over comes the, you know, one of the waiters, and it's, you know, this is a six-foot-tall guy who's about 50 years old and uh, in a, you know, butcher's apron. And he gets a cell, and he says, oh, you know, okay, it's great to have you here. You know, what are, what are you going to be having to drink tonight? Uh, you know, okay, so martinis for, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Tolls here. That's terrific. We make a great martini. You know, for the young man, what would you like? And uh, Coca-Cola, absolutely. And then he turns to my, my daughter and says, and what about for the baby? And from the expression on my daughter's face, he can tell that he's made a terrible mistake. <laughs> and after a moment of heavy silence, my five-year-old daughter looks at this six-foot tall man in a butcher's uh, apron and says, I am not a baby. <laughs> at the other restaurant, they call me La Principessa. <laughs> now, to the credit of the waiter, he, uh, he says, absolutely, yes, and he kind of backs off the table and di <laughs> disappears. And, uh, and we're, kind of, we're kind of like, oh, like, oh my god. And like two minutes later, he shows up, and there's four six-foot waiters now in their aprons lined up. And he goes, gentlemen, I would like you to know that from this point forward, when the Tolls family comes to this restaurant, she shall be known as La Principesa. <laughs> and they're all like, everybody's nodding their head, and my daughter is nodding her head. Very, <laughs> that's very Now, uh, so the, the, the second story I just wanted to share, which is, uh, uh, another sort of piece of my life that ends up in the book is that um, in, in the book, the actress that I mentioned earlier, who the Count sees in uh, the lobby, uh, he, something he does sort of annoys her. So and she uh, invites him to her suite, seduces him, but basically with the intention of then uh, dismissing him unceremoniously, which she does. And so as he is sort of sheepishly leaving the room, um, he stops to pick up the dress which has fallen to the floor and to put it on a hanger and put it away in the closet and then he kind of slinks out the door. And as he's doing this, she's watching with sort of imperious satisfaction, you know, that she's gotten this ex-count to sort of hang her dress. But in the, in the nights that follow, the image of him hanging the dress really begins to annoy her. It sort of drives her crazy. You know, who does he think he is? This ex-count hanging my dress trying to, you know, Put his, you know, his, show me what, to, what, what, you know, how I should act. So, sort of to teach the world a lesson, uh, she just stops picking up her clothes at the end of the day altogether. And, you know, and the more expensive the gown, the better on the floor. And, and over the course of you know a couple of weeks, there's suddenly there's you know her room looks like an Arabian tent with brightly colored fabric all everywhere, and her maid, um, you know, finally uh, chastises her for being childish. You know, insists that she picks up the clothes. And the sort of tempestuous actress says, oh, you know, you want me to pick up my clothes? And so she sweeps them all up, and she goes to the window, and she throws them out the window into the streets of St. Petersburg. And, you know, so, so, so there, and storms off to bed, and the, you know, the maid kind of wisely sort of just walks away without saying anything. And sure enough, at 2 in the morning, the actress kind of wakes up, tiptoes down the stairs, goes out into the street, and sort of sheepishly gathers all the clothes back. Now, this scene is one that actually played out in the Tolls uh, family. Um, it, it, it occurred between my mother and my father uh, shortly after they were married. Um, although it was my mother who willfully was sort of throwing the clothes on the floor night after night, um, it, it was my father who kind of in, a, in exasperation finally gathered all the clothes up and threw them out the window into the courtyard of their apartment building in Cambridge. Um, but I will leave it to you to guess which of the two of them slept soundly through the night and which of them went out in the middle of the night and gathered up the clothes. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope you will uh, uh, put yourself under house arrest in uh, my book, you know, at least for a couple of pages. You know, I, uh, 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 is it Wendy Pearl or uh, 
writer, creator of uh, Booklust. I love uh, her rule as a librarian um, that you don't, you don't have to finish a book. You know, why should anybody feel like they have to finish a book? We, we've all had that feeling in our lives where, you know, oh, I've started, I've got to finish it. And, and her thing, I don't, I'm sure most of you know, is what you really should do is you owe a book uh, 100 pages minus your age. So <laughs> if you're 20, well, yeah, you should give it 80 pages, right? You've got all the time in the world. You can give it 80 pages before you cast the book aside. Let it sort of unfold. But if you're 80, I mean, give me a break. 20 pages, if it doesn't capture your interest, move on, right? You know, and, and I, love that, I love the fact that the rule, if you're 99, give it one page and that's it. Right? Either it captures your imagination or quit. So I, 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 I do ask uh, that, you know, that if you're willing to put yourself in the hotel under house arrest, you at least give it the 100 minus your age, uh, and I'd appreciate it. But thank you very much for, for having me.